all of our heart and soul and strength. Come, let us worship God. Yet at other times, we haven't done as well. We've added to the measure of sin and sorrow in this world. Oh God, forgive us for that which we've said, thought, or done, or else that which we have failed to say or do, which could have been healing and constructive. Oh, understanding God, we confess that sometimes we live in dread fear of what will happen and of what will become of us, believing that it all comes down to us and to what we say or do, or whether or not we fall on our faces in trying. Instead, Lord, grant us vision and perspective in seeing things as they really are, 
and to be governed more by our faith than our fears. And if we have been dwelling too much on ourselves, help us to live for something larger than only ourselves. And forgive us, God, for the manner in which we shore up our inner emptiness or anxiety with false substitutes for your peace which passes understanding. Lord, we confess that sometimes we look to outside things to fill us up, to make us feel good, or to tell us that we matter. But it's all so fleeting. And that same hunger and longing comes back again. Instead, remind us that we are yours, that you are ours, and that nothing, not even our own occasional obliviousness to you, can separate us from your love. And God, forgive us if we have let despair take root too deeply in our souls and, and if we have forgotten how to live in hope and expectation of something new and wonderful coming along. Lord, we confess that we fear change. We sometimes dread the future. We forget how to see your hand at work in the past and present leading into the future. Instead, O oh God, grant us the freedom the courage and the hope to be able to dream and to work for those dreams. And thank you for the peace of the truth you've given us and for hands and hearts and voices to express that truth. Merciful Creator, in quiet and confidence, in hopeful expectations of forgiveness and peace, we confess and silence these sins which have remained unspoken. and compassionate God. Receive these sins unto yourself through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who took our sins upon himself, that we may be forgiven and set free to try again and to do better. These and all things we ask in his name. Amen. Reminding us of how vast and wonderful the love of God is, in 1400, the writer William Langman said, All in the world that humanity might work or think that is evil is no more to the mercy of God than a live coal dropped into the sea. And so by the grace of God, your sins and my sins are forgiven. Let us make amends if we can. Let us do better next time and let us live as people of the resurrection. Amen. said, Let, lest the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people round by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had solemnly sworn the people of Israel, saying, God will visit you. Then you must carry my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. 
And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night by a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. And these words from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter, beginning of the 57th verse, which you'll find on page 901 in your church Bible. As they were going along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now another one who was there with him said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Bless the hearing of God's word from both the Old and the New Testament. And now let us receive our morning offering.
that we will be having a service of remembrance this Wednesday evening at 7.30 in our sanctuary for the anniversary of the attack of September 11th. As well, this coming Saturday morning at 8.30 in the Great Hall, we will continue in the great spirit of the men's retreat we had this past May with a, with a breakfast. We hope the men of the congregation will come. And we need to know how much food to make, or should I say, how much food Ed Harlow will make. <laughs> Was that a surprise, Ed? <laughs> so you'll find an RSVP sheet in the narthex. Today at 11.15 in the Great Hall, we will present the second in a series of three informational meetings regarding recent developments in the life of our congregation. We will continue largely with the format from the first meeting from last week, the only difference being if we have any additional answers to questions from last week. We hope the entire congregation will attend one of these meetings. It's important that we all be on the same page with this information that we need to present. And finally, we welcome the Reverend Pablo Diaz as our stated supply pastor. In these crucial times in the life of our congregation, Pablo brings us a wealth of experience in ministry. Some of us have heard of his good work that he's done in other congregations, but many more of us have already seen his healing work in our own congregation. And the rest of us will see more of Pablo as he shepherds us through these times. If you're wondering why do we need an interim minister unless, until this situation is resolved, we need a shepherd. Kathy Garner is needed for church school. I'm at the medical center during the week. And for every minute of, uh, that you spend in the pulpit preaching, you are supposed to spend an hour of preparation for the sermon. It takes a lot of time. We need somebody there. Pablo came highly recommended to us. A committee of session interviewed him and felt the same. And he brings a multitude of gifts that we badly need in these times. Much as our prayers are with Jack, he would be the first to say, we have a great work to do as a church. We have so many programs that have begun and need to keep running. And so pray for us, hang in there with us, and let's honor Jack's legacy by working with Pablo until we find grace and resolution. God said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And so let us offer our prayers to the Almighty. O oh God of all nations and generations, we offer our gratitude for another new morning after the peaceful slumber of a late summer night. For even in the darkness of that night, there is the song of life teeming all around us, reminding us that you are here and that all will be well. We rest in the assurance that whether the way is clear or if the path seems rocky, you travel this journey with us and you have provided us good company along the way. Oh God, we trust that your, pro your promises, that life is continually being renewed and even in the midst of change, and often scary change, something new is waiting to happen, that it will be different, that it will be good. And yet we pray for your peace of heart, for your peace of mind, for your strength and hope for those of us who live with fear and grief in these difficult times for us as a nation and also as a congregation. And yet still we trust and we hope on this coming anniversary of September 11th, we remember those who, whose lives were lost and others who were forever changed by these events. We continue to pray for healing and for recovery for our nation and for the day to arrive when peace and justice will reign throughout this world for all of your people. And in the meantime, bless the hearts and minds of all who would work for the healing of bodies, of minds and spirits of individuals and for the mending of the souls of nations. As we pray both now and as well as when we're alone, 
Let not our prayers be things we say to do, we say to try to change your mind. But Lord, rather let our prayers be the pathway to change our minds, that we would want what you would want for us and for all of creation. And let there be a spark within us that gets lit today or in this week ahead to see and to feel things in new and different ways. Let there be epiphanies and revelations that lead us to love more, to be isolated less, to throw off the chains of old ways of thinking and acting, to be less fearful and more faithful, to laugh, to cry, and to live more fully and deeply this gift of life, and to never stop giving thanks and celebrating this gift. Lord, bless those making new beginnings in schools and workplaces. Grant them clear-headedness and confidence in facing up to all the joys, the privileges, and responsibilities of these new times they are beginning. And bless this congregation that even in the midst of these uncertainties, we may still be able to reach out into the unknown and to feel the touch of your familiar hand. And guide us and guard us, O oh God. Be with Jack Miller in these times, letting him, let him know that both you and we are with him. Be with Pablo Diaz as he makes a home among us. And we thank you for his journey with you that leads him to journey with us. And for the truth you've given him, which he needs, which he will teach to us. Bless our Sunday school teachers. Bless our elders, our deacons and trustees, and our bless our choir. Bless us all in these times ahead, that even though we may be angry or afraid, we are still your people, and your people of a larger mission, and of a great work to do both here and beyond these walls. God, we trust, we hope, and we labor on as your people of the resurrection with the song of the Lamb on our hearts, and the words you taught us, your Son taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom.
Diaz. Good morning. Good morning. I've been preaching for a long time, but I tell you what, last night as I slept and dram, had several dreams, I found myself preaching several sermons. And it is indication that this sermon is probably one of the most important sermons I've preached in a long time. But I trust that you will listen gracefully with love and openness as I seek to share what God has put in my heart through prayer and much reflection. The role less traveled. Pastor and author Max Lucado tells a story about his adventure to the office from his home. Each morning he found himself waiting long minutes in a long line at a long light and always mumbling there must be a better way. Some of you can relate to that in terms of the traffic you must confront as you go into the city. While a half a mile from the light, he spotted a shortcut, an alley behind the shopping center. He decided it's worth the try. Turned on his blinkers, made a quick left, bit farewell to all the crawling commuters. He weaved his car between the dumpsters over the speed bump. The alley led him several minutes faster than the other drivers. And if you know male drivers, you know he was really proud. <laughs> Until one morning, his wife was in the car with him. And as they were approaching this same light and he already had figured how to cut through, he said to her, hang on, honey. He swerved from the sixth lane onto the one lane and drove his wife into his secret expressway to freedom. And then he turned to her, as most of us do, what do you think, sweetheart? I think you broke the law. What? You just went the wrong way on a one-way street. So he drove back, you know how that goes, he drove back, can be true, he drove back and next to the big orange dumpster was a sign that said, do not enter. It's human nature to seek the shorter, the faster, the easier road in life. No pain, no gain is better said than experience. The membership list at a fitness center includes many people who never show up. People purchase top-of-the-line workout gear, but it never gets out of the closet. There are many times when we in life spend long minutes, if not long days or hours, waiting on a long light, on a long light, on a long light, wondering there must be a better way to get through this process. There's got to be a better way to live life. We hope and we pray for a shortcut or a miracle that would avoid the painful and the difficult circumstances of life. That's just who we are. I don't like pain any more than you do. I don't like difficult circumstances. When I am sick, my wife knows that I become like a little boy. <laughs> and she tells me, grow up. You're going to get through this cold, OK? <laughs> it's only fever. The Hebrew community in the Old Testament knew firsthand what it meant to travel together through uncharted territory. The book of Exodus begins with Israel suffering oppressively as slaves in Egypt. But in a climatic moment, we read and we are told that God delivered them and they crossed the Red Sea and began a new life. Keep in mind that the book of Exodus, where I'm going to emphasize this morning, is not history in writing, but the proclamation of a community salvation story to subsequent generations so that they too will know and encounter the liberating presence of God, the God of Exodus. Exodus story is critical. The experience of Exodus is vital and central 
and Israel's understanding of itself and of its faith. And it too has had an incredible impact in the Christian world. The text that I would like to focus is on Exodus 13, verse 17 to 22. And it sheds some light as to what might have happened after the people of God left Egypt. But more importantly, it provides a window of opportunity into the minds and the hearts of the writers who tell or retell the story several hundred years later from a faith perspective. And looking back, they could see the presence of God in their travels. The ups and downs of the journey were understood as the divine movement of God in the life of Israel. Listen as I read the text. God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though it was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might not change. They might change their mind and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert toward the Red Sea. One would think, after all the hardship and oppression and the challenges that the people of God experienced in Egypt, that the road to the Promised Land would be smooth, easy. But life has its own rules. We are pressed when we least expect it with difficult circumstances as we were pressed a year ago on September 11. Regardless what role they took, the people was confronted with a serious challenge. If they went through the country instead of around, they would have to face war against the Philistines. Got to keep in mind, these have been, they have been slaves and not soldiers. This reality might have caused them to change their minds and want to return to the familiar captivity. Although they had been liberated physically, they still were struggling emotionally, mentally, and learning to discover what it meant to be free people. And you know, this tension is throughout the book of Exodus. And if you read later on, they do cross the Red Sea. They end up in the desert a lot longer than they ever anticipated. And in the desert, it was a difficult group to lead. But God was present with them. Well, let's get away from plan A. Let's look what plan B was. See, I like multiple plans. I always got more than two plans. As a matter of fact, I got about 10 to 15 if I could. I always thinking plan A, plan B, plan C, Plan D, E, F. When my kids come with a problem, I say, okay, what's plan B? All right, they end up in plan B. Okay, you got plan C. What do you mean plan C? Got to be thinking, always, looking at a problem from multiple ways, and trying to figure what is the best way to resolve it. So plan B was the one they had. It was an opportunity to get to the Red Sea without engaging in war. But it was a long way around. But in looking back, the writers understood that God was part of the journey and that God was in control. The journey through the desert was not without difficulty, not without conflict and frustration and anger and disappointment and despair. It is always easier to look back and make sense of things that happened to us. But God knows and you know that while we're in the process and while we're in the pain and we're in the challenge and the marriage is going through, it's hard times. And the son is ill or daughter's ill. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good. It doesn't make sense. You see, one of the most pressing times in my family was when my wife Elba became pregnant of our second child. During the fifth month of pregnancy, we discovered that our son had hydronephrosis, fluid around the kidney due to a blockage. The doctor told Elbona he has a 50% chance 
of surviving. We have no guarantee what he's going to, even if he come, if is delivered, how he's going to be. You have the option to abort the child, but we took the road less traveled. And for the next two months, the doctors monitor the vital the development of the vital organs of my son, Paul, keeping an eye on his heart and his kidney, his liver. But at the seventh month, as we went for that ultrasound on Halloween day, never forget that. The doctor said to Elbow, you're going to deliver. Why don't you come back later? We'll induce you and we'll deliver the child, the baby. She said, not on Halloween day. <laughs> <laughs> so we came back after midnight. During the first year, he was operated four times, including a 12-hour operation at Children's Hospital in Boston. Every time Paul would get a call and you took him in, it was a long journey in the hospital. They had to figure out it was quite delicate. During that time, our faith was tested. Our relationship was stretched, including my three-and-a-half-year-old daughter at the time. She had to learn to live in an environment that was very sensitive, delicate, with lots of pain. But through this entire process, God's presence was with our family. And God's presence became visible through family members, through my friends, at Andover Newton Theological School, the faculty, the seminarians, they cooked for us. Dr. Joe O'Donnell visited us, the professors came by. The medical professionals at all the different hospitals care for us, the chaplains would drop by. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Doug, for your ministry and assure us that we were not alone. We learned how fragile life is. And most importantly, and this is the truth, our lives were transformed and touched by the courage of a baby boy who kept fighting and fighting and fighting for his life. The Hebrew community would end up spending a lot of time in the desert. The desert experience helped them to create their identity as people of God. It helped them to understand and to rediscover God's presence. They also learned to be dependent upon one another and to search for, for resources and directions and guidance. And we read towards the end of that passage God's presence was found in the pillar of cloud. That's, they understood that. And at night in the pillar of fire, there was light for travel. The signs and symbols of God's presence and love and care are always around us. We need to open our eyes of the heart and see that regardless of where you are in the journey or where we are in the journey as a community of faith or as a country, God continue to be visible. As we approach September 11th, we can look back and see how America has united in a deeper way. In one of the most darkest moments of this country, we've seen the hand of God help us find good in what is considered an evil act. Yes, we continue to hurt and as we approach it in the next few days, a lot of feelings and memories will surface. But God will comfort us. God will guide the Presbyterian Church of Mount Kisco and give it strength as it journeys in a road less traveled. But let me tell you, your congregation has been around for a long, long time. Your gifts are many. Your history is strong. And your God continues to walk with you and walk with me. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Eternal God, 
most of the time when we're thrust into these kind of roles or family issues come up, or parents are hurting or ill, regardless of the circumstances, we confess that it takes a toll on us. It creates an imbalance and where our lives become very unbalanced and we seek desperately to bring normality and balance. But sometimes that's difficult. Allow your presence to guide us and to lead us. Allow your presence to lead us individually, to comfort us, give us wisdom and insight, but also be with us collectively. As a church, as a country, as your community of faith. Allow us to trust you and learn what it means to rediscover you when things don't go as we had anticipated. But we know one thing, O oh Lord, you're the God of history. And you will walk with us and you will guide us and lead us. And we too will reach the promised land through your grace, through your peace, and through your mercy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.